Well, we've been in a, uh, a sermon series over the last four weeks called Focus. And it's just trying to, to grab focus of a very unfocused life. Um, first week, I just ask you to figure out all the distractions that go on in your life, all the stuff, all the, the busyness and the messiness, and ask yourself, what am I focusing on in life? What's important? What's a priority? Because when everything becomes a priority, nothing is a priority. When everything's in view, nothing is really in view. And so that first week was just kind of, can we make some priorities of life? And can we focus on what's really important in life, not what's urgent in life? The second week, I ask you to focus not on Christianity, not on religion, not on a denomination, not on rules, not on on stuff we're supposed to do. Just focus on Jesus. If our lives would be so much more consumed with Jesus than with religion, our lives would be so much more powerful and we would live with so much more joy. Last week I asked you to begin to focus on significant relationships in your life. Not, not surface level pseudo relationships, not going through the motions of relationships, but being willing to dig deeper and ask harder questions, to become vulnerable and transparent with each other where, where true love can really begin to flow. And today I wanna to just finish this series and say I wanna focus on your purpose. And I don't know if, if you thought a whole lot about that, but I wonder if you've ever thought about, you know, what's my, what is really my purpose in life? I can tell you what it's not. You're, and you know that these things, your, your purpose is not to make a lot of money and to build big houses and have a happy life. That's not, that's not a, a purpose. Your purpose is also not to become a Christian. That is not your purpose. If that were true, the moment that you became a Christian, God would have taken you home. As soon as you believed that Jesus was your Savior and that heaven was prepared for you, as soon as you knew that, God would have taken you home. Because heaven's not your purpose, it's something else. So what is your purpose? Why are you really here? Why are you still alive? Why are you still sucking air? Because God has another purpose for you. And when you have completed that purpose, you get to go where he is. And so I want to focus today on what is your purpose. I'm going to talk to you about a uh, kind of a dream deal and I have had our kind of whole life. We've always wanted to see the aspen trees change colors because we've always heard that the aspen trees, when they change colors, their little round leaves, they kind of flirt like this and it just like look, it's supposed to be really beautiful. And that's kind of a goal of ours. And so we decided to fly into Aspen this last week to see the aspen trees because people told us it was the perfect week to do that. And so we did. And here was the view flying into the airport. So you see the mountain with snow and you see the beautiful uh, uh, landscape and there just covering the mountain are aspen trees. But you really can't get a very good view of them because they're so far away. So we took another picture. This was them up close. This was kind of the view outside of our hotel. And it was amazing to look at that and see the, you know, the dark green firs and spruces and pines and stuff and the texture of all that and some of the aspen trees that had already turned and some that were turning and, and just that whole thing was just so amazing. And what was interesting to me is when I was standing there looking at that, I just imagined judgment day. Like there's God on the very top the Bible said that he's called everyone to himself, all tribes, all nations, all people, 
all colors, all races, all ethnicities, everybody is there and they're all standing as a crowd. And I looked at that and thought, I wonder what that's going to, is that what it's going to look like? You know, kind of all of us there and we all look kind of different. And then when I realized that was so beautiful, but I never noticed that tree. I didn't even see that tree until I saw the picture. It was right next to me. And I thought that's kind of a metaphor of our life. Sometimes what's right next to us that's so important, we don't even notice. Because we are so fixated on everything that we don't see the one thing. And had I just stopped for a moment and paid attention to that, I would have seen an aspen tree up close, but I missed it. So that's what I talk to you about today in the scripture. I want to walk through um, the calling of disciples, in John chapter 1. And the text I'm going to share with you picks up, uh, and I'll read the beginning of it because it just picks up. It says, the next day Jesus does something. Well, this next day that Jesus does something is the day after he did something else. The day he did something else before was when he called a guy by the name of Andrew to be a disciple. And Andrew went and got his brother, Peter, and they became disciples, followers of Jesus. And so this is the text that uh, goes with that. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. So there's my first question. Do you follow? Do you follow? Because if you and I are ever going to discover our purpose, the first question we have to ask is, do we follow Jesus? I'm not asking, do you believe in Jesus? I'm not asking you, are you a Christian? I'm not asking you, um, are you a part of a church or denomination? I'm asking, do you follow Jesus? Because that was his invitation. He didn't say, come with me and go to church in the synagogue, or come with me and um, let's get busy doing stuff. He just said, come and follow me. Now, what does that even mean? It means, do I follow him in that I do the things he asks? Do I live the way he lived? Do I approach people in mercy and grace or condemnation and judgment? Do I get involved in religion, but not in the relationship? And that's what he's asking for. Come, follow me. Don't come and follow your religion. Don't come and follow the guidelines of Christianity. Come and follow Jesus. And when Jesus says, let's go this way, we'll go that way. When Jesus says, go that way, we'll go that way. When Jesus says, forgive that person who's hurt you, we forgive. When God is saying, move towards that person, we do that. That's what a follower is, which is very, very different than a Christian. A Christian is someone who believes that everything that, that is said about Jesus is correct. The problem with that is the Bible says even the demons believe The difference is the ones who believe and follow. So he calls us to follow. But here's what's interesting. He's not the only one who calls us that, calls us to that. In the New Testament, a guy by the name of Paul will have this other phrase that's really interesting. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. So let me just ask you a question for a second. Is your life so exemplary that you would call people to follow you the way you are, to act the way you act, to behave the way you behave, to carry out life the way you carry out because you are such a close representation of Jesus? Because that's the invitation that Paul is asking. Follow me, because if you follow me, you're going to understand what Christ is all about. So my question is, do you follow? 
or are you a good Christian but not a good follower? You see, this word disciple literally just means replica. It comes out of the Old Testament where you take a, a, a lump of clay, and after you formed and fashioned this clay to look just like that pitcher, and now it looks like a pitcher, that's called a disciple of that. And that's what he calls us to, to be a follower that begins to replicate his heart, his passion, his desire. He goes on, Philip found Nathaniel, a friend of his. Remember, Andrew found his brother, Peter. Now Philip finds his friend, Nathaniel. And he told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophet also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We have found. We have found. Is that your story? That you have found? Again, I'm not asking you, are you religious? I'm not asking you, do you go to church? I'm asking you, have you found the one you follow? And if so, what's that story? Do you know that story? I, I have to interview a lot of people for uh, work in a church, and in doing so, I have to hire a lot of Lutherans, because we're Lutheran. And I always have my favorite interview question. Tell me your spiritual journey. Tell me your spiritual journey. And almost always, I get the same one. I was baptized as a little kid. I went to confirmation, was involved in youth group. Now I go to church. That's not a spiritual journey. That's spiritual checking the box. And so I'll push back and I'll say, okay, glad you did all that. Tell me about your spiritual journey with Jesus. What does that look like? That's a, that's a much harder question to answer. Like, they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, when did Jesus become real to you? Not an object of faith, but something that became tangible and real for you. What's that story look like? And I'll tell you, it was late into high school, almost the end of high school, when that happened for me. I did all the things I was supposed to do. I got baptized as a baby, went to confirmation with my dad, had to memorize the whole catechism under him, hated him for that. Then we had public examination in front of the whole church, which means he could get up and ask any of us any question he wanted to do that was in the catechism. He asked me five questions. I got every one of them wrong. And he was a not very proud dad of mine. He was just like, did I fail him? Um, and for me, it was just something I did. You know, that's just what you do. You go to church, you learn the catechism, and, and you kind of go to be a good person. In high school, there was a guy I worked with. And he too went to church, but somehow his relationship was so different. It was passionate, it was tangible, it was real. He talked about the Lord. You could tell he loved the Lord. There was this genuine sort of connection with God that he had. And I was like, you kind of seem like a Jesus freak to me. And he just explained to me what his spiritual journey looked like. And I thought, I didn't have one of those. And that's what he's asking here. He, he's saying, I've, I've found the Lord. I've seen the Lord. And he invited him not to religion, but to a relationship. And I'm just wondering, have you ever thought about your spiritual journey? Has it been going through motions, or has it been the introduction to someone that is the love of your life? He goes on, Nazareth, Nathaniel said, how can anything come out of Nazareth? He says, come and see. In our today lingo, it would be church, 
What possibly could come out of church that are filled with a bunch of hypocrites and self-righteous people? So there was this sort of bias against uh, Nazareth, like really, just like there's a bias today against church. And, and, and he doesn't get all put off by that. He just simply says, well, come and see. Come and see. In other words, let's see if, if it works for you like it worked for me. There's an interesting um, church I went to this last year, and it was a, it was a fairly large church, and they, they had a very advanced marketing program. Spent tons of money on marketing and social research and social media, social presence. They did a ton of, of, of advertisement. And they were kind of stuck. Nothing was really happening. And the pastor said, I, I came to my senses kind of. I realized, again, this is a large church. He said, every Sunday, every Sunday, 20,000 missionaries left my church and went out into the mission field. 20,000. And if I could just train them to be a missionary to their mission field, the people God put around their life, and if they could reach just one, what would that look like? Two years later, no marketing, no social media. The church worships over 50,000 people because of one thing. The people in their church learned this phrase, come and sit with me. Come and sit with me. It's exactly what he said. Come and see. Come and see. And he just drilled down that phrase that I want you to start looking at your circle of friends and realize you were strategically put in that circle of friends to accomplish your purpose, which is to bring what you have seen and heard and experienced and bring those people along with you. He said, we don't ask anybody, we don't, none of our people say, you need to go to church or, you know, come to my church. It's, it's come and sit with me. I want you sitting next to me. And he said, two things happened. One is that everybody in their church got a whole lot more critical of their church. What does that mean? When is the last time you ever invited someone to go to a restaurant with you because you liked it? And that night, the waiter was slow, the food was cold, and the bill was high. And all of a sudden, you were super critical of a place you loved because you are now thinking about their experience, not your experience. And he said, one of the things that will make you a better church is when people begin to invite their friends. The other thing is the stick rate of that person that you brought staying with you in that church is amazingly high. Why? Because you sat with them. You explained or answered questions. You were, you were there for them. They knew you were there for them. They knew that you were, that this was an important thing. And so you may even have people going, well, you know, I'm really going through a bad marriage. Are they having a marriage series right now? No, they're not. But they're going to introduce you to one that can fix your marriage. So sometimes we, we wonder, you know, this sermon's not about that, you know, what that person's going to go through, so I better not ask them. God knows the issues. It's not by accident those people come with you on the Sunday they come. But we have got to, as followers, not as Christians, as followers, the way Jesus went out into the crowds and said, come follow me, come sit with me, he's saying, I want the same thing to happen for you. I want you to start getting comfortable with the phrase, come sit with me in church. He says, it is amazing what will happen to your church. He goes on. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said, here's a tr- uh, truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. 
Now, that's an interesting frame, phrase, in whom there is no deceit. Uh, scholars are kind of mixed on this particular phrase. Some believe that he was a Jewish person and kept the Jewish law very well. And so, therefore, he was not a hypocritical Jew. He was a, a good Jew. Um, others in the preponderance of, of sort of scholarly thinking is that what he's saying is this guy you brought me is not a believer. And his lifestyle is not hypocritical. He acts just about how an unbeliever should act. And I think that's something that Christians have a huge problem with. Your heathen friends should be acting heathen. They should be because they don't follow the same guidelines you follow. They don't have your Bible. They don't have your faith. They don't have their trust in God. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit. They're just living a life without God. Why do you expect them not to live like heathens? I've had so many people say, there's no way I could ever invite that guy to church because he's sleeping with his girlfriend. Surprise to God, no. Oh, he's got such a, whatever, dirty mouth or, or terrible alcohol problem or whatever. About right. Why is that? Because those who don't know God don't behave like those who do. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Who did Jesus hang out with? He did not hang out with the religious people. He didn't hang out with the people who were all into their rules and regulations and hypocrisy and judgmentalism. He had no time for them. Who did he have time for? The prostitutes? The tax collectors? The heathens? The one far from God? That's who he hung out with. Matter of fact, that was the complaint of the Pharisees toward Jesus. He was always hanging out with sinners. He would go to their home. He would invite them into his teaching. Friends, here's what I want you to realize. If you have heathen friends, that's awesome. And don't get put off by their heathen lifestyle. They qualify as someone who gets to come to Jesus. And don't judge them. Not, not your issue. You don't get to do that. That's God's job. Don't be put off like it. You should, when they're telling you their horrible lifestyle, go, yep, that's about right. Seems normal. Don't go, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. It would, like, it would be like you trying to hold me to the rules and regulations of the Quran. Those aren't my rules. I'm not going to live by them. People who aren't Christians are going to go, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't live by those. They don't need your rules they need to know about your relationship with Jesus. And so it's kind of important that we realize he already knows all this. He goes on to say, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now here's what I want you to hear today. There's a person God has put in your life. He already knows them, and he already knows how they're going to come to him. And he strategically put you in their life. He knows them, and he knows their role in his kingdom. And all that he's asking is, can you bring them to me, and I'll take care of the rest? Because I've already planned on them being a part of the family. You're the person I have positioned in that relationship to move them there. Philip had a divine calling. He had a purpose. And his purpose was to bring Nathaniel to the Lord. That was his purpose. If there's anything that still um, hurts my heart at this church after five years, is I'm not sure we have permeated that community. God did not call us to any other place rather than that community and your friends. That's who God's called us to, your friends. 
And when you're doing what God has called you to because you are a follower, you begin to discover your purpose. And there's so much joy in that. Um, Let's finish up. Will you follow up with this guy? I want to go back to one I missed. Um, When he said, um, you know, come and see. Don't, when, when you and I get asked questions by people who don't know us, we get freaked out. And it keeps us from actually entering into a relationship. We're like, I can't bring that person because I don't know all the answers. Don't worry, neither did the disciples. Do you know none of these disciples who were called had seen one miracle Jesus did yet? Had not heard one teaching? Had not seen anything of the crowds who were gathering? He just said, I want you to blind me follow. So when people ask you answers, you don't have to answer them. You can say, I don't know. I'll Google it for you. I'll talk to somebody and find out. So don't freak out when that happens. Let's go to the last one. Um, Will you follow up with people that you have invited? Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than this. And then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Philip had no idea when he invited invited Nathaniel to come and see, to come and sit with me. That that encounter was going to be so powerful that God was going to speak to him in his life like he had no idea. What would happen is Nathaniel's name would then be changed to Bartholomew. He would be a disciple, a very influential disciple, so much so that because he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus, he was filleted alive. He was skinned alive. That's what Jesus is saying. You think you've seen great things. You're going to give your life for this faith that you just discovered. When I was in high school, my best friend, his name was Len. He was not a Christian. <laughs> he was about as heathen as they get. Something we used to do on Friday nights, this, is, this will date me, we used to break into cars and steal tape decks because um, he thought that was a fun thing to do. And me being the follower, I went along with him. Um, but he led me into sin and I was happy because I could make some money off of it. But it was terrible. He was a terrible influence on me. But I was constantly talking to him about Jesus, constantly. I never judged him. I just hoped he would come to Christ. Never did. A couple of years later in uh, college, he wrote me. And he said, Doug, I became a Christian. Today, Lynn is a pastor who leads missionaries all over the world. And when I heard that, I got so angry with God. I was like, what? I poured at this guy for eight years telling him about Jesus and nothing? I said, how did that happen that you became a Christian? And he's like, well, when I got college a friend of mine asked me to go to church with him and when I was at church I met Jesus and I looked at that and thought I never invited Lynn to go to church not once and I could have I could have invited him into the presence of God and somehow in that God would speak to him and reach him and I didn't and he sent me with that he, in this letter, he said, but Doug, you tilled all the soil. This guy just planted the seed. And I just wonder sometimes if I could have seen the harvest had I planted the seed and just said, you know, I've been trying to tell you what a great life it is with God. Why don't I let you come and see what that looks like? And so here's my challenge for you. 
if you want to find your purpose, your purpose lies within the people who are around you. That's your purpose. God has put a mission field around you. They will never want to come here unless they see in you a life that looks different. Unless they know that you are willing to tell them that you have found the answer to life, that you found Jesus, and your life is a great example of a Christ follower. You are preparing the soil that when they encounter Jesus through the word, it's going to take root. God already knows which one of your friends is going to come to Christ. He knows it. He's planned it. He's prepared it. And he put them around you because you're the one with the sack of seeds. Focus on your purpose. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you entrust us with a sack of seeds. And God, if we can just begin to see our friends as hearts that need to be tilled, that we need to show them, God, in our life and lifestyle what it looks like to be a follower. God, if we could just do that. If we ourselves could be such an incredible follower that when people look at us, they see the differentness of our life. They see the love and the grace and the mercy that pours from us. Not a better than, but on equal ground, but one who has found a whole new life. God, would you give us that desire to follow you that closely? And then God, would you give us the boldness to invite them into something that we can't do anything about, lest the Holy Spirit do it. Give us the boldness to ask them to come and sit with us in church, sit under the teaching of the word, sit under the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. And God, may we keep doing it and keep doing it until the miracle happens where faith comes to life. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus. And together we lift our voices as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.